So yesterday, there was this interesting paper posted on the archive talking about dynamically generated logical qubits. And this paper makes a quantum error correcting code in a sort of interesting way. And I thought this would maybe be a good opportunity to show how you can take a more complicated quantum circuit and put it into STEM in order to get samples out of it as part of, you know, doing research into error correction. So what I want to do in this video is I want to take the construction described in this paper and I want to write Python code that produces a stim circuit for it. Uh, before I really get into that, I, I want to discuss what this construction is. Okay, let's just get into a drawing program here. So at the like circuit level, what happens in this construction is there are qubits at each of these intersections. And the like hexagons and edges and so forth are telling you what operations to do to those qubits. So there are like three, there's like a three round cycle. And in the zeroth round, you look at the hexagons marked zero and you look at edges between them like this one. So like this edge connects between two zeros. And you're going to measure the parity of the two qubits that are crossed by this edge. So this qubit and this qubit and the orientation of the edge tells you the type of parity you're gonna measure. So you're gonna measure the ZZ operator between these two qubits. And also simultaneously, you're gonna measure the XX operator between these two qubits and the YY operator between these two qubits and so forth for everything. Uh, then once you've done that, you move on to the ones and you would measure ZZ here, YY here, XX here. And you do that in a cycle. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to make a circuit that just does that. Uh, so here I have a Python environment. Um, I'm just going to get this on the right hand side so we can see it while we code. And uh, STEM has been installed into this Python environment so I can use it. And our goal is to write generate circuit method which takes some distance scale and also some time scale and produces a STEM circuit. Now the, the first thing to do generally when you want to make these things is you want to like set up a coordinate system you want to compute a bunch of data structures like dictionaries and lists that just say what are all the points and what are all the edge types and so forth um, so the first thing that we need is like a coordinate system that includes the centers of these hex hexagons and also the these intersections where the qubits are now this coordinate system here, which actually uses hexagons, is not so great because a lot of the edge lengths and the like X and Y displacements are irrational numbers. So they don't store particularly nicely in like floating point numbers. Instead, we're gonna square this off. So we're gonna like flatten out these columns so that we get squares. So our modified coordinate system will look something like this. where we have square columns. And then we have the divisions like this. And that. So we have columns of squares and they are offset with respect to each other by a half amount. Uh, so like this would be zero, this would be two, one, two, zero, and so forth. So you can see how this matches up to that. But here, uh, our coordinates are 
squared off, and so they're going to be nice numbers. So we'll say that the origin is right here. So this is 0. And then one step to the right there will be 1. And one step further here will be 2. And if we go in the other direction, if we go down one step here, or, or here, that'll be the imaginary direction. So this will be i, this will be 1 plus i, uh, and so forth. So imaginary goes up, uh, imaginary increases this way, real increases that way, and this allows us to index the whole thing. So first things first, let's make a let's make a list of all of these hexagon centers. So hex centers is a list of complex. And uh, we have a unit cell here. So like the unit cell stretches like this. So it goes down three steps and it goes over two steps. So we're going to iterate over a number of rows. That's three times our scale and the number of columns. That's two times our scale. And then the, the position of the center is going to be the row times two times the imaginary value because when we go down here, we skip twice. And it's going to be plus two times in the real direction along the column. And additionally, the odd columns are all shifted up by a half. So shifted up by a half, or in this case, one if the column is odd. Okay, and we append that into our list of centers. And, and this should now be uh, a list containing all the positions of these things. Now, one thing in the paper is that this is supposed to be a periodic system. So I have this this tiling block, or, or maybe we're in a bigger system and it would be something like this. And when we go off the bottom, we want to come back in on the top. So this position here, uh, oops, I don't have the right, the right cell. This is, uh, this is zero. So this is supposed to be like this. Uh, anyways, this position here is actually the same as is this one here because you you know you wrap around because it's a torus. Uh, so I, I should actually have a method to do that that wrap around. So that method will take a complex number, it'll take the, the distance, wire keywords, and it'll spit out a complex number. And all we're gonna do is mod into the correct thing. So I think it should be distance times two here. Oh no, it should be times four because we're we're multiplying multiplying by two. Do the same thing for the imaginary, except now it's six because there's a times three and a times two. Uh, and here I want to keep these things in range. Uh, now this is this is like complicated enough math. Like there's a lot of places where the, I could be I could have the wrong sign or I could have the wrong factor. I want to actually test, or I want to see that this is doing the right thing. So I'm going to write method to to print out uh, the the values. It's list of complex. And I'm printing, so I'm not printing anything. 
Um, I, I should I should check that the list is well formed. Like I'm expecting that all of the values will have real coordinates that are integers. Uh, similarly for the imaginary parts. Additionally, I'm expecting them to be non-negative. And that all that being true, I should be able to compute the a bounding box for the region, which is the maximum of the real coordinate for the n values. If there's nothing, I default to zero. And um, because I'm getting the maximum value instead of the count, I have to add I have to add one. Do the same thing for imaginary, and then just iterate over it. So for each line, for each character in that line, get the character. Oh, I'm actually expecting this to be a dictionary instead of a list. Let, let's let's change that. I think that'll allow us to store information with each point, like whether it's zero, one, or two. Uh, dictionary complex. Let's store the type in a minute. Okay. Uh, right, c equals values dot get x plus y times 1j. So I look up the value. If it's not there, I'll just default to underscore, get the string. And we're going to be building up lines. Th this, this particular way of writing it can have quadratic overhead because I keep modifying the string and strings are immutable. I don't know if Python does optimizations to fix that. It doesn't matter for the scale of things we're doing, though. Uh, right, so we generate a circuit with minimum distance, doesn't matter how many rounds we're picking yet. And we just do a quick debug check that hex centers makes sense. So we run this. Float cannot be an integer. That's because I didn't do a conversion here. Okay, well, let's increase the distance a little bit. This this looks reasonable to me. Like it, it looks like I am getting like this point and this point and this point and this point while skipping over the ones in between. Uh, now I just need to you know change these threes to actually match what's happening here. Um, and if you look at the indexing scheme that they have, they start at zero at the origin, so that that's good, and then they decrement when as the row increases so zero minus one is two modulo three and then minus one again is one and minus one again is zero so the category category is going to be minus row mod three and then some other stuff to account for the column and it looks like as you increase the column, it just goes down by one and then returns, and down by one and returns. So for odd column, it's it's one lower. So minus column mod two should do that. Is that right? Uh, I guess these twos ended up at the bottom, but that that's fine. Uh, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, two, zero, two, zero, two, zero, two, zero, two, zero. Yeah, that looks right. Okay, good. We have the centers of the hexes. Uh, the next thing that we're going to need is the qubits. Uh, and also we're going to need like the types of edges data. So I, I know that I'm going to need the, the edge data and I'm going to need like multiple values associated with each edge like how do i get if i'm following this edge how do i get from here to this qubit or how to get from here to the other hex and also like what is the type of this edge so i'm going to declare a data class which is just an edge type and it's going to have you know a, a pally type this will be x y or z it'll have a hex to hex 
delta, which is going to be a complex value that tells you how far apart the hex centers are. And it's going to have a hex to qubit delta, which tells us how to get to the qubit. And we, we can negate these to go in the opposite direction, so we only need one of them instead of two of them. So edge types equals edge type. Uh, we have the Z type. That one is the one that moves horizontal. Yes. So when we're moving horizontally here to go from this zero to this zero, we have to go one, two, three, four steps. So hex to hex delta is four. And hex to qubit delta uh, is just here to there. So that's one. All right, next edge type is x. x is this direction. So the real number is increasing. The imaginary number is decreasing. Um, and I believe that's here to here. So that's 1, 2 in the real direction. And 1, 2, 3 in the imaginary direction. And to get to the qubit, we go over one real and down one imaginary. So one minus one j. And because this whole thing has a mirror symmetry, I know that the y case is just going to flip flip these signs. Okay, those are three edge types. And now, once we now that we have that data, we can compute uh, the qubit coordinates. So that'll just be a set of complex numbers. And we'll get them by starting from the hexes. So for the hex centers and for the edge types, and I guess we can go in either direction along the edge type, so we'll have a sign. Then the qubit position is equal to the hex center plus the edge types hex to qubit delta times sine. And then we add that into the qubit coordinates, making sure to keep it inside of the, the torus. Uh, and then I want to print that out also. So I'm going to make like a just a, a quick debug thing where I make a copy of the, the hex centers and for each of the qubits I set it to Q. I just print out the fuse thing. So what I'm expecting to see is a bunch of Qs like running down the, the columns in between here because that, that's where the qubits are here. There, there are no qubits here in this coordinate system. That's, that's empty space. Like there's, there's no qubit here. Uh, oops, I just put this comma in the wrong spot. Okay, good. This this looks right. I, I will mention that I kind of worked out what I should do here ahead of time. I, it's not a coincidence that things are going this smoothly. When I was initially working it out, it did not go this smoothly. Like I, I didn't realize, oh, I should use this rectangular coordinate system and, and everything was a mess. Uh, regardless. Uh, now we have our cubic coordinates, now we have our, and our hex centers and our edge types, and I think this is enough information that we can sort of start making the circuit. So uh, the circuit is going to be composed of a cycle that involves three rounds. So we're going to make a circuit for each of the rounds. Uh, and within a given round, we have to find all of the edge types or all of all of the edges that we're supposed to be measuring. And we do that by going over the hexes. So uh, relevant hexes equals H for H category and hex centers if the category matches the round. Let me over each of the relevant hexes and we go over each of the edge types uh, 
And that'll give us a pair of qubits. So uh, the first qubit, which is the center plus the edge types x qubit delta. And the second one is the hex on the other side, in, but going in the opposite direction for the hex to qubit delta. Uh, we don't we don't have to worry about the sign here because every edge has a hex on each side and one of them will be the, the positive case that covers it. Um, so we have the, the edge groups. Just a dictionary from strings to lists of frozen set of complex uh basically i want i want to separately store the x y and z so that that's the key into the dictionary is going to be x y or z and then each of those is going to have some list of edges and i'm going to store an edge as a as a as a set so that it'll be two elements in the set one for each of the qubits And I guess I can initialize it to have each of the groups empty. Let me say edge groups of the edge types, poly. And we're going to append the set containing Q1, Q2. Let's print this out to see if it actually is working. Okay, uh, let's let's drastically decrease the distance so we get less output. So, uh, let's see. In the z direction, during the the zeroth round, there's apparently a z edge from position one to position three. So we go to, to our coordinate check system to check. So position one is here, position three is here, and this is in fact a z edge between two zeros. So that that's good. That looks right. Uh, there's a y edge from 1 plus 1j to 1 plus 2j. So 1 plus 1j is here, and 1 plus 2j is there. That is an edge between two zeros. And is it the y? Yeah, that, that is the y direction. Okay. Good. I, I'm basically expecting this to be correct now. And I think we can move on. So we have all these edges. Um, so now we want to use them to make our circuit. So we're going to make a circuit. Um, we need to take each of these edges and we need to get their values onto one qubit. So the, the first step to doing that is to fix the fact that some are x, some are y, some are z. We'll apply single qubit operations in order to get them all to be z measurements that we want to do. Uh, so there are x qubits, which are the qubits in the group. An x. Ah, so this is a pair Q and pair. Okay, so y qubits. And what we want to do is we want to apply a Hadamard operation to the x qubits. Uh, actually, these, these, these are complex numbers. They're not integers. They have to be integers. I have to index my qubits. Qubit to index dictionary from complex to int. And it is going to say q to i for i q in enumerate of the sorted qubit coordinates, where the sorting is done by uh, the real coordinate, then the imaginary coordinate. The reason to sort this is to just make absolutely sure that we get a consistent ordering so the circuit doesn't change every time we run the, the program, which would be very confusing when we're trying to debug it. 
Uh, anyways, just convert that like so. And maybe we print out that circuit just to see what it looks like. We get a key error. Uh, oh, I forgot to normalize these. Will I ever stop forgetting to specify that parameter? Only time will tell. Okay, uh, we apply the, the h operation to x qubits to the y qubits. We're going to apply a variant of the h operation where instead of rotating around x plus z, it rotates around y plus z. You could also use a, a square root of x here, but uh, I like using this one instead because I don't have to remember if I use square root of x or the inverse of square root of x. Uh, so in the, so this, this is make all, um, make all the parity operations, Z basis parities. And then at, uh, once, once we're done measuring them, we're going to, we're going to put it back. So restore cubic bases. Uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to apply controlled not operations to turn the parity observables that we want to measure into single qubit observables. So turn parity observables into single qubit observables. And that's going to involve a CNOT operation between each of the pairs. So pair, we're going to need pair targets. And this is going to be pretty similar to this. Actually, I should sort these. Uh, oh, and I should extract this, this sorting order that I'm using. Just so I can stop writing it constantly. Okay. Gotta fix that. Nice simple looking. Okay. <clears throat> so four group in edge groups, four pair in group, four Q in pair Q. Great. Um so <laughs> Uh, in STEM, by the way, this is sort of flattened out. STEM is going to understand that this pair of things is the control and the target. And then we're just going over all the edges by, by having these this nested for loop. Uh, so we apply the CNOT to the pair targets. And we measure. So we're going to measure uh, the second qubit from each of the, the C naught pairs, like the target of the C naught, because that's where the, the parity went. And then afterwards, we're going to undo the C naughts, undo the single qubit transformations, and that will have achieved the parity measurement. Okay, look, looking at the circuit, it is not happy. I forgot a Q2I. Better. Uh, this so at this point we have enough circuit in order to sample measurements from the system. Uh, the initialization might not be right, but at least like once we get into the steady state, whatever that is, we should be getting valid measurements. 
Uh, let's let's do that. Uh, let, let's be a little more proper here. Put a main guard in. So I can declare variables without uh, polluting the global namespace. So I take my curve circuit, I compile a sampler, and I take so 10 samples, and I print them out. Oh, I didn't I didn't actually finish building the circuit. Uh, we have to take this thing that we build, append it into the round circuits, and then the cycle is sum of the three round circuits. It's one after another. And the full circuit, I guess, is just the, the cycle times the number of rounds. Okay, got samples from it. Um okay there, there's a there's a few things to fix here. First of all, the, the circuit doesn't have any um any metadata. Like it, it, it this doesn't really matter for the simulation, but in terms of someone reading the circuit or a tool consuming the circuit, it's it's kind of relevant for us to say like where are the qubits? So they're not just laid out on a line. Okay. So I, I'm going to add qubit coordinate annotations. So for uh, UI in the Q2I dictionary. We're going to append qubit chords. It's going to take the qubit index i, and we're going to say that the qubit lives at the place where it is. So now when I print out the circuit, you can see at the start it just it just throws in that like, hey, here here's a hint for where the qubits are actually in space. Um anyways, we can Get some samples. And I don't think the samples are printing particularly nicely because NumPy, of course, as usual, massively over abbreviates everything. So we'll have to print it for ourselves. Which uh, I know how to make look pretty decent reasonably quickly. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so e each of these lines is a full shot of this thousand round circuit with distance one. Let's increase the distance, decrease the rounds to 50, I guess. And we see, oh, there's an interesting gap right here. What is that? Oh, that's probably the, the Z basis measurements in the first round, because when we initialized the qubits, we, we made those deterministic, right? Like the, the qubits initialized in the zero state, so the ZZ measurements on zero, zero are going to be deterministic. Uh, but then in later rounds, they're going to have been randomized by the measurements that they anti-commute with being in the way. All right. Next thing that we have to do for this circuit is we have to actually say... What is the error correction supposed to be working with? Like, which measurements are supposed to be compared in order to f notice where errors are? Like, what are the deterministic pairs of measurements or com sets of measurements? Um, and basically, the way this this thing works is so this is a z-type edge. So this is this. Is going to be measured in the zz basis so our, our things that are staying constant are sort of six body observables around one of these hexes or each of these hexes and obviously if this thing is going to stay stable it's going to have to commute with this thing leaving the system so that observable is going to have to be z here uh, this is x so it's going to have to be x here and y there and that can finish off the rest pretty easily like that 
So you do, do this just by looking at the types of the errors and concluding that like if we don't want this to spread all over the place, this is what has to happen. Um, we can also check that you know when we measure this edge, which is going to be an XX measurement, XX here commutes with these with this six body poly product because you know XZ XZ anti commutes and XY also anti commutes and those anti commutations cancel out so that they commute. Uh, additionally, you you like check the ordering, and you see that uh, in the ordering. I hope I get this right. You know, all right. So there's the edges between the ones. So there's this edge this edge and this edge those get measured and those three together as a product then commute with the edges that get measured with the twos which would be this one and this one and this one that ordering is extremely important if you instead went in like this order where you did this one then this one then this one then this one it wouldn't work um because you you'd be like destroying the information as you went along. It's, it's important that you do these three separated ones first before you move on to these ones. Um, also very important, um, if you're looking at this one, this one, this one, then that one, that one, that one, that works. But if we instead look at this one, then this one, then this one. Oh, sorry, I get those backwards. At two, two, two. Before we get to the ones, we're going to go through zero, which is going to measure this and this and this. And these all anti commute with the these edges that we measured. And that's going to destroy the relationship that we're, we're trying to use so that we, if we then add on these edges, it, it's not going to work. So uh, all, all of that together, we have to look at contiguous rounds, like one, then two, or zero, then one. And we have to look at, in those contiguous rounds, like sets that form hexes, and they build them up in these three pieces. So that that is what we want to explain in the circuit. We want to say... Look at the measurement here and here and here, and also the measurement here and here and here. And together, those six measurements should be some stable thing. So if we compare the product of those six measurements to the same product from the previous cycle, it should be staying stable. That is the idea. So we need to find those six measurements and tell Stim to use them. So at uh, I'm going to keep the these things separate from the round circuits, just because we need to do a few rounds before we're into a stable state where this makes sense to do. Like in the in the very initial round, there's nothing from previous rounds to compare against. So we're going to keep them separate so that we can use them separately. Uh, anyways. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So we want to make detector circuits for R and range 3. Uh, so we're going to make the circuit and ultimately append it into this list. And in between, we have to append detector operations. And this is going to take measurement record targets. So for example, it'll take a value that looks like this. And this just says the most recent measurement. That, that's what this value means. And this one would be the second most recent measurement and the third most recent measurement and the fourth and so forth. So this is this is going to be running at the end of 
a cycle. So for example, we just ran the zeros. Let's not do all this. So for example, we just ran the zeros, and before the zeros, we ran the twos. So you'll notice that these close around the ones. So we're going to be looking at the edges around the ones. Um, I suppose I actually need data to describe these edges. Like if I, if I have this hex center, how do I find each of these edges to use? Like I have to key the measurements by, by the edge. So edges around X will be a list of tuples of complexes. And there will be six values, one for each edge. And I, I guess I just, I'm just gonna list them off manually. So there's minus, minus one, minus one J, two plus one, minus one J. So that, that's this edge here. And then we want this one, which, is that to just plus one and then the from that middle one here to this bottom one which is going to be plus one plus one j <clears throat> and then from that one we go to the negative side and then we start traveling up until we get back to minus one, minus one J. So I should have six edges going around. <clears throat> These are two complex numbers. Okay. So relevant hexes this time, instead of being the round number is the round number plus one. Uh, so I just take this code here, paste that, add one, make sure it's all mod three. <clears throat> and this will give us all the relevant X centers. And then for edge in edges around hex. Um, we get a key of some sort. I should take the two displacements. Q1 is, oh, I need to be iterating over the hexes. For each of the hexes, for each of the edges around the hex, get the two qubits. Keep them nice and centered. And I guess we're probably going to be using of uh, into z's instead of the coordinates for the key. Uh, and now we need to know when when did this happen? When did this measurement happen? So measurement times is a dictionary from the edge key, which is a frozen set of integer to some time. So current time is zero. And every time we do a measurement here, we get an edge key. Um, 
and we say that the measurement time for that edge key is the current time, and we advance the current time. Um, now this is assuming a particular start time. Hmm. Measurements per round should be that, and I, I should offset by that somehow in order to, to get the actual times, although I'm not really sure how to do it yet. And measurements per cycle is just going to be triple the measurements per round because there's three rounds per cycle. Yeah, that, yeah you're wrong about that. Uh, okay. So. Relative index of the edge is the current time minus the measurement time of the edge key. Um, but the start time, or the, the end time for the round, the end time for the round is equal to r plus one times measurements per second. So it's actually the end time minus that, and this should be mod measurements per cycle. I th think that's right. Uh, and and then I have to convert it to uh, th this. This normalizes it into the range zero to n, and I want it to be in the range of minus n to one minus one. I think this is the right relative index. Uh, so, <laughs> we were going to append a record target of this, this relative index. And we're also going to append a record target of this relative index minus the measurements per cycle again. The idea being that we want, we're going to be comparing this to the, the previous cycle. So we're including each edge as well as its partner from the cycle beforehand. Oh, this should be relative indexes. Okay, and we should append a detector using these record targets. Also, we should annotate the detector with the locations. This is not necessary, but it is uh, very convenient to have this information available. In this case, location would be the center of the hex. And there also be a, a time coordinate. And we'll use, uh, where's the loop body? At the end of the cycle, we'll, well, at the end of the detector circuit, we'll append a coordinate shift just to, like I, I said zero here because this is always, you can only have one line in the file corresponding to the detector, but we're inside of a loop. And to deal with that, we're just going to shift the time coordinate forward each time. Uh, here. Okay, so the the initial cycle, like what we're using to get the system in, doesn't have these detectors in it, but the stable cycle 
once it has been established, will. So after each round circuit, we turn on the detector circuit. Two, one, two. Okay, and the stable cycle is the one that has that. And the full circuit is the initial cycle. Uh, I don't actually know how many cycles this takes to establish the stable thing where we can start doing these comparisons. I'm going to use a conservatively large number. Let's, uh, I need to look at the circuit that I produced in order to see if, if it makes sense. Uh, this is too big. Okay, so we may have the cubic coordinate annotations. We have 10 repetitions of what is supposed to be, like just measuring these things a bunch of times to get the system into a stable state. And then we start doing the measurements, but each time we do the measurements, we say, hey, by the way, you should be able to compare these sort of recent measurements in order to get detection events. So in the case where we just have the one tile from like here to here, and this is like the zero round. And in, after the zero round, we're like, ah, oh, these ones you can do. Uh, so that it makes sense that there's two of them. Uh, it, it's a bunch of measurements being compared. It's, I think, 12 of them. And that also makes sense. Uh, we are comparing the most recent measurement. That's, that's a good sign that I might, that I got the arithmetic right. Uh, here, does it compare the most recent measurement? Yes. Minus one is right there. And here's minus one present. Yeah, and this one minus one is not present. This one might be wrong. Uh, a reasonable way for us to confirm whether or not it's wrong is instead of sampling the measurements, we can sample the detectors and sample them 10 times and see if they are deterministic. They are very, very not deterministic. I definitely don't have the, the right thing. Um, is this supposed to be minus? No, is it supposed to be not plus one? No. Okay. So the things that I'm comparing are not quite right. Hmm. Okay, I, I shouldn't just add and remove plus and minus ones in random places. I should actually think about it. I could have an error in my edge data. Never actually carefully, carefully checked that. Let's check that again. Yeah, that looks right. That looks right. That looks right. Uh, yep. 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 So that looks correct to me still. Uh, that looks good. That looks good. Good. What if instead of using the end time, I just use the current time? Will that make two of them work? Oh. Okay, that that looks a lot better if I flip that. Okay. Let's 
Switch to enter. No, it still doesn't look right. Um. Uh, so, so what I'm what I'm seeing here is it looks like two detectors are wrong, and then four detectors are right, and then two are wrong, and then four are right. So I'm I'm pretty sure what's happening is that during the zeroth round, when it's comparing the one cells, it's it's getting this like offset math wrong. I'm not exactly sure how it is getting it wrong. Thirty-six fifty-four. Uh, wait. Oh. Oh, I think I just used the wrong variable there. Yeah. Okay. I I I just I confused the rounds and the cycles, which. You know, you have two periodic things nested inside of each other. Yeah, you can do that. Okay, so now our detectors are behaving nicely. And we can do an, an even kind of stricter check where we compute the error model for the circuit. And uh, if, if we had the detectors wrong, so if, if I change this back to measurements per cycle, this will actually throw an exception and say that um, they're they're not deterministic like they're supposed to be. Like the measurement set that you said to compare that is supposed to always return the same thing in the circuit obviously doesn't. Uh, anyways, uh, this detector error model is sort of trivial right now because it's just declaring a bunch of detectors and it's not actually using any errors because I haven't put any errors in the circuit. Um, probably the easiest place to put errors into the circuit is on the two qubit operations. Like that, that will be as hard as anything else. So we can apply that to pair targets, maybe apply it with 0.1% probability. And now the error model, yeah, is looking, is looking a lot more complicated. And wait. There's only four symptoms per. Does this decompose? It does decompose. Is this thing a surface code? Uh huh. Okay, what what do I need to do in order to check if this is a surface code? Uh, I guess maybe I should put in some other some other errors first before I go jumping to conclusions. For Q and Qubit. Do single qubit polarization in between each of the rounds. Still looks like it's working. Okay, interesting. Well, if this is a surface code, I should be able to decode it using um, using pi matching. So I'll get. Pi matching. Um, uh, I, I I happen to have submitted an issue on this, and in that issue, I put code for converting a stim circuit into a pi matching thing, which I'm just going to copy paste. And uh, I guess put at the bottom here. Uh huh. No by matching, right? Uh, 
just install apply matching. And while that's that's working, um, so I can get what this method does. So test decoding, take a thousand shots, use the circuit that I generated here. It'll compute the error model. And the shape of the syndrome vector is not valid. What? This is some, some technical detail of the conversion that's failing, probably because I have, I'm inserting errors before the, the I, I only start turning on detectors after like these 10 initial cycles and I'm putting errors in the initial cycles that, that obviously can't be corrected. Um, so I should fix that. Also, I haven't actually yet said where the logical qubit is in the system. So it doesn't have anything to use as its like basis. So I, I guess before I jump straight to trying to decode it, I should try to initialize the logical qubit. Uh, I actually don't know where it is. I have to look at the paper. Uh, okay. Logical qubit runs like this. Oh, I guess which single qubit states am I initializing the whole thing into? Nice. Simplifying, decoding, measurement of logical qubits and initialization. Measure F Z basis, measure. Why well, did they do say it's the Torah code? Anyways, is equivalent to the Torah code, a similar strategy can be used to measure outer logical operators. I really wish that they just had a diagram instead of using prose. Um, I guess I can just try to find it. Okay, it is now the next day. I struggled quite a lot to actually find the logical observable in the system. Like, the paper annotates roughly what it is here, but I had to actually email the authors and ask about exactly what's happening in order to, to figure out what was going on. Like, um, there, there's like a component of it that's not shown here on this segment, and exactly how you update it from round to round is, you know, is... The general idea is said here, but the specifics aren't given. Anyways, I I worked it all out. I I sat down and I drew where the logical operator is and where the other operator is that antecutes with it, and I'm uh, I'm just gonna go over roughly what I figured out from having thought about this for several hours and talked with Mike Newman, my coworker, about it, and talking with the authors about it. So um, I've already shown this layout and sort of explained it near the start of the video. Um, here is where the two logical observables are roughly going to be. There's one of them that goes down the middle from top to bottom. It's going to move around within this center, center line, but this is where it's going to stay, roughly. And then there's the other one going in this other direction, wrapping around. Now, the other thing that I didn't realize about the logical observables, I knew they would move a little bit as the rounds progress, but I didn't realize that they would have a period of six. Like, they only come back to their starting point after six rounds, not after three, even though it's a three-round cycle. Um, 
But here, here's where one of the observables starts. Um, I have this color coding scheme that, I, that I'm using where Z is green, Y is blue, X is red. And I'm just going to move this over here so it's on screen at the same time. So I, in this step, uh, it has a Z poly on here, an X poly on there, nothing on here, Z on there, Y on there, and, and, and so forth. This is the logical observable just before round zero. And you can check that the measurements that are happening during round zero commute with this logical observable. So for example, there is this Z component here, which is here. And this is a ZZ measurement and ZZ commutes with, with Z. And, you know, red commutes with red. And, and the same for the rest of them. Now, this wouldn't commute with what's about to come in the next round here. But you can multiply some of the things that you measured in this round into the logical observable. Um, specifically, you take everything along that center path that I pointed out. Every one of the measurements that's along that path, you multiply it into this observable. So, for example, there is this y alley on this qubit and we're going to multiply y y into it which is going to cancel out this and move and it cancel out the y component here and add the y component there so it's going to move this blue square down by one step and if you scroll down here you can see that blue square moved down by one step uh, also I, I stopped drawing this green square at the top because it was only there just just for completeness to sort of indicate that this is wrapping around um, anyways Basically what happens going from this step to this step is that the blue and red squares move down by one in the, the path. Uh, and you can then check that these, not only do they commute with the previous rounds of measurements, which uh, of course they're going to because they, they commuted with those measurements and then we multiplied some of those measurements into it. That won't change the commutation relationship. But now also it commutes with the next round's measurements. So for example, here, we on this edge here we're measuring red the two body red operator so red isn't the same as blue or green but if it differs in two places instead of one that still commutes so that this is still fine it all all commutes and you basically just keep doing this you you do the measurements for the round you take the measurements along the observables path and multiply them into the observable and that gives you the next observable and you, you do that six times total before you get back to the starting point. Uh, and you do the same thing for the other observable over here. You find you, you find the initial thing through through a little bit of trial and error. Uh, I really wish that they had included this in the paper. Anyways, you find this and then you follow the same procedure. You multiply the measurements that are along this highlighted purple path into the observable to get the next observable, which will then commute with the next round and continue that way. Uh, it is important. Uh, something that I initially got wrong when I made these is it's important that this observable and this observable anti-commute, they have to, where they overlap, they have to have different colors an odd number of times. So if I just bring this over here to, so it's a little bit closer, I can kind of show where they differ. So uh, where they overlap is like here and here where the paths cross. So green and blue are different. So that's one difference. And then they overlap again here and here. That's another difference. Uh, they, they also overlap here, but there's nothing over there, so this one doesn't count. And then there's a third difference here and here. So there are three total different places where they overlap and they have different colors, different pallies, and therefore they anti-commute. Uh, actually, originally, I was saying I found something that commuted. What I found was this one three later. I found the one... I found this one. And if you actually check this one, it commutes 
with this one. Uh, this off by three observable two commutes with observable one. And so for a while I thought there was something kind of seriously wrong. But then uh, my coworker Mike Newman, who I was showing this to, pointed out that I, I was just off by three. I, I just needed to take the one from three rants later. Actually, um, the the one from three rounds later here, like, uh, just gonna undo stuff. This this observable down here from three three rounds later commutes with the one up here from three rounds earlier, and it anti commutes with the corresponding uh, observable one there. So there's actually two logical qubits in the system because you have two pairs of anti-commuting observables that commute between each other. But we're we're just going to stick with having the one, the one logical observable to keep things a, a little simple because uh, I'm having a hard enough time wrapping my head around the system as it is. Um, so hopefully that makes it clear where the observables in this system are. Now we have to explain this to Stim. And I've sort of already said the words for what we're going to have to explain to Stim, which is after every round, we have to go down this path and multiply any of the measurements that were along that path into the logical observable. Stim has an instruction for doing this called observable include. Um, so we append an operation observable include and give some some set of measurements which we'll figure out by by looking for stuff along that path that occurred um by the way the the code is in a slightly different state than it was before i guess the cut that i'm going to have made between today and yesterday uh, i added some comments because i actually sent this to to the authors of the paper when I, when I was asking about where the logical observables were. And before I sent it, I, I added some comments and cleaned it up just a little bit. Hopefully, it's not too different. I don't, don't want there to be any huge discontinuities. But there will be some. All right. Uh, so what what is the plan here? What I want to do is I want to add, add the observable into the circuit which is going to involve um, saying how to measure it at, at the end of the circuit and saying how to update it from round to round during the circuit by giving the parity measurements that should be folded into it. So uh, a little bit unlike last time, I haven't really thought through the details of what basically I'm going to have to do. I'm kind of doing this a little bit blind. So I, I guess I apologize if this is a little bit rougher than it was at the in the first half of the video. Uh, okay, so unlike with the detectors, which I only turn on in the middle of the circuit currently, with the observable, I have to correctly track it through the whole circuit in order for it to work. I, I can't just focus on the parts that are noisy. So I'm not going to put it in this parts of the rounds that are focused on the detectors. I'm going to put it in the main part of the circuit that is always included. Um, I'm also going to have to update, I'm going to have to initialize the circuit in a way that makes the observable be deterministic somehow, which I also haven't really figured out exactly how I'm going to do yet. But let's get going. So at the end of the round, I want to multiply relevant measurements into the observable. And for now, we're just going to track one of them. We're going to track this vertical one because it, it's kind of simpler. Um, and I guess we might as well pick the one that's the furthest to the left, the one where the real coordinate I guess it wouldn't, the real coordinate would be zero. The real coordinate would be one. So I don't I don't have my figure with the indexing system anymore for the the coordinates, but 
Uh, in the coordinate system, this here is column zero, and then this diagonal line is column one. And I'm going to say that the observable is along column one. Uh -huh. So I need to find all of the pair targets that are along column one. So for each group, for, uh, for the pair and the group, if I uh, get the two elements of the pair, if both of their real coordinates are equal to 1, then this is one of the measurements that I want to include in, in the observable. So included measurements. And so I want to append it. And I've been indexing the measurements as I go here. And I am taking the two indices of the cube. It's not their coordinates, their integer indices as the key for the measurement in order to look up its time. So the edge key is the index of the one qubit and the index of the other qubit in a set. The time that it was measured at is measurement times of the key. And I want it to be relative to the current time, so I subtract off the current time. And then like it should give me the relative index of the measurement that I can include. And now that I have that, I can append into the circuit this observable include instruction, give it those measurements. I think that that's right. Um, this yellow highlight is annoying me. I'm just going to flip the, the logic here. So I've been counting the measurements as the time, and then the rounds, there's three per cycle. So I can just divide that by three. It's going to be a multiple of three. Oh, uh, I need to say the observable index here. It's observable index zero, just arbitrarily. Now, I believe later on in the circuit, yeah, I'm saying that the observable is somewhere else, but I, I, I've commented that this one is wrong. If I run it right now, it's it should fail. Yeah, good. Uh, which is because this observable is... At the end of the circuit, after the last round, I have to say, where is the observable? Exactly, like which, which measurements am I including? Also, I should be measuring the data qubits in, in the basis of the observable. So because there's these two cases where after three round, after multiples of three rounds, after each cycle, it could either be in this state or it can be in that state, I'm going to have to do the logic conditional on that. So if rounds is odd, I'll have to do one thing, and if it's different, I'll have to do another. Um, I'm also not exactly sure how to write the code saying what the initial observable is. Like here, here I've got it figured out for lay, for column two, and I did that by hand. But I really want it for column one in the code, because I know column one is always there. Um, so I haven't even figured that out by hand, never mind how to do it by code. 
But I know, I know the general idea is I'm going to have two thirds of the observables along this line. They're going to one. They're going to alternate between these two different color pairs, and I just have to find the ones that um, commute with zero, the ones during zero. So let's let's just look at what that that's going to look like. Okay, so during round zero, we're doing these measurements, and I'm going to have some observable down this column. Um, I guess I want to find the observable that agrees between zero and these two rounds. So I need to like have it here, which has to agree there. So I think I do red, green to match here. And then in this round, that'll also match. Oh, I'm figuring out this one. Okay, yeah, yeah. Right, I'm trying to figure out the observable that matches between these two rounds that, that agrees with both of them. So that, that part is good so far. And then probably it's going to go blue-green. So I think I'm going to have all the greens. With reds like that. And blues like that. And uh, it commutes here because it's the same color as the measurements that are touching it. And it commutes down here because they're both different of, compared to the color. And then I need to check that these actually, uh, that if I multiply the edges along this path into it, that I get an observable that's going to work for the next one. So uh, saying that again, no, wait, this isn't, is it going to work? Uh, okay, I'm going to annotate in the pieces, like so. And then I am going to multiply into these pieces each of these edges along along the path. So I'm multiplying blue into red and green, which is going to swap their color. Like this. And then I'm going to multiply red into the blue and green, which is also going to swap their colors. Like so. And then I need to check if this thing commutes with whatever's in the next round to make sure that it still works. And I can immediately see that green here matches green there, red here. Well, I, can, I can just move this down to kind of go like that. And I just undo, redo to kind of flicker it back and forth. Undo, redo. So Looking at the topmost one here, green matches with green. Looking at this one here, red matches with red. Yeah, this this is right. Good. Um, so now what I have annotated here is what would be the observable between these two rounds. But I actually want the initial observable before the first round. So I have to m compute what that would be. And that would be the result of multiplying the things along this path into what I have annotated here. And that's just going to like move this red box up here and move this blue box here like so. And I need to encode this pattern into code. So I need to have the pattern 
what is, what is the pattern exactly? The pattern is starting starting from this row, which is the origin. The pattern is green, blue, blank, green, red, blank, and then it repeats. Uh, and in my colors, green is Z, so this is Z, R is X, is Y. So along that first column, I need Z, Y blank, Z, X blank. Actually, I'm just going to assert that the rounds are an even number. I'm just going to do the one case. Uh, so I have, to, I have to encode this into the circuit in two places. I have to encode it in during the initialization of the circuit. I have to say this is the basis that the data qubits along this column are initialized into. I'm not going to try to figure out the full fault tolerant initialization, which would require me to figure out all of the data qubits values. I'm just going to assume the initialization is noiseless. And the same for the measurement. I'm going to have to measure them in this basis. And again, I'm not going to try to do the full fault tolerant measurement. Um, so at the beginning of the circuit, I want to do an initialization. Initialize data qubits along logical observable column into correct basis for observable to be deterministic. So the qubits along that column are all the qubits, I believe, with coordinate, with real coordinate one, because that's what that column is. So Q for Q and qubit coordinates, if Q dot real equals one. I also want to sort them from top to bottom. Like so. And then I want to assign them uh, bases, so initial bases along column. And that's just this xy space, xy space, zx space. And these spaces I can make whatever I want, I'm just going to make them z. And that will be multiplied by our distance. So, four qubit and basis in the zip of the qubits along the column and the initial basis along the column. So, pair them up. If the basis is x, so the x initialized qubits are the qubits that satisfy this condition. And the y initialized qubits are similarly that where the basis is y. And now, now that I see how the code looks, I know I can change these back to underscores because the qubits default initialize into zero. They initialize into z, so I don't have to do anything special for z's. All right, for the x basis qubits, I'm going to uh, use a Hadamard operation to get them from the Z basis into the X basis. For the Y basis qubits, I'm going to use that variant of the Hadamard that rotates around Y plus X. And that should handle the initialization. And because my rounds are even, this should also be what I measure. So if I if I do this again at the end of the circuit before the data measurements Oh, 
Oh, I actually already have this quiz column. Good. This might be the right observable now. It might be. Uh, ah. I want the indices instead of the coordinates when I'm going to use them as arguments like this. Detector observed lines can with the measurement of reset. Hmm. Let's turn off all of the detectors just to make sure that we're actually dealing with the logical observable. So there are now no detectors, so I know it's the observable that's antiquating, although I don't exactly know what it's antiquating with. It's possible that I wrote this pattern down wrong. Uh, nope. Z, Y, Z, X. Z, Y, Z, X. Not X, Y, Z, X. Hmm. And I believe this pattern... Okay, I don't need the circuit to be quite so big. I just need two cycles, I think. I'm, I'm just trying to get the logical observable working, and then I can put all the stuff back together. Oh. Oh, right. I'm, I'm including... Um, XYZ initialized. Are any of the qubits where it's not blank. And I only want to include qubits from that. So the qubits to measure is the XYZ initialized qubits. And the order is... Okay, qubits to measure is this expression. And the order is essentially the same expression but using the coordinates. We're going to split out the coordinates by themselves. Derive the indices from that. This should still be a list, not a set. And then the order can be q to i for i to q in qubit indices to measure. Uh, right, right, right. Uh, minus line, should it, this is to measure four, I am order dot values. I think it's, it's worth another try. Let's actually print out the circuit. And just take a look at it. Okay, so we initialize. We do two repetitions of the cycle. During the cycle, we do round zero, and then we include some measurements in. We do round one, we include some measurements in. We do round two, we include some measurements in. That makes sense. And then we get to the end, and there's only one data measurement added. That doesn't look right. I think there should be two data measurements. Hmm.
How many cubits are along this column? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. Uh, let's jump into the debugger and look at what the values are as we go. Uh, cubit. Cubic words to measure. What are you? We are measuring the first one, the second one. We're skipping the third one, going to the fourth one, going to the fifth one. That makes sense to me. And then we step forward. The indices measure zero, one, three, four. I don't know what the indices are actually supposed to be, but that that's the right number of things. What's the order? Oh. How is this? Index zero to bounds. Oh wait, wait, this this uh this is an error from Pi Charm, I th uh from Pi matching. I think that means it made it past the construction of the error model, which would imply that the observable is correct. Uh, okay, that is sort of a we. Uh, this is sort of a bug, I think. The fact that it's repeating this many times, it won't matter. Uh, I don't have any errors in the circuit, which is why the the error model that's being printed out immediately after the circuit is just saying, "Hey, there is an observable in here. There's an observable in here. There's an observable in here." Um, if I do put some, some errors in, like if I put some depolarize, some single qubit depolarizing error on the qubits to measure, then I should see, oh, I need a probability. I should see maybe a chance of the observable being flipped. Maybe if I put it in before the measurement instead of afterwards. Yeah, okay, there we go. So the... They added an error that has a chance of flipping the observable. If I have four cycles instead of two, it should still work. Yes. All right. I think I'm ready to restore. Uh, I should change these to the even numbers since I'm assuming rounds are always coming like evenly. That ran to completion. I can turn the detectors back on. Good. And um, I could turn on a noise process to see if the error model is still reasonably well formed. Yes, that all looks good. Okay. We, we are now at what I would consider to be a pretty interesting point. I'm pretty sure I have the circuit now. I'm reasonably sure that I have the correct operations, that I am saying to look at the correct things in order to generate detection events, and that I've annotated where the logical observable is. And that means that I can do decoding experiments. Be because the because apparently you decode this thing using a matching algorithm and pie matching does matching, I can use code that I already wrote before that it, I guess in the previous half of the video I, I was saying would, how to do this. But now that I have the stem circuit, I can get an error model out. I can convert that error model into a pie matching, like matching graph. I can sample from the circuit. I can give those results to pie matching. And then it should correct the logical observable in the presence of noise 
and tell me how often it succeeds. I basically am extremely close to being able to compute the threshold of this thing. We, we've gone from nothing working to we can almost compute the threshold. Uh, so let's see what happens if with the, the distance set to 1, the round set to 50. Assuming that, this is, that there's not some terrible mistake in the middle of this that's making it all broken, then with one unit cell of this hex, which, which is uh, this big, the logical error rate is around 40% after 50 rounds, 50 noisy rounds. If I increase to two unit cells in both directions, so, so that's actually what's drawn here. This, this is the two unit cell system. The logical error rate should go down, assuming we're below threshold. So we run that again. It'll take a little bit longer. I didn't expect it to take this long. Uh, but it finished, and the logical error rate went down. And then if I change the distance to 3, well, it didn't go down by much. I was expecting it to go down by more than that. Anyways, if I change the distance to 3, and I run it again, this might take a little while to finish. So maybe while it's doing this, I'm going to throw together a quick method in order to like invoke this multiple times. So, um, compute threshold of of some process for generating a circuit. Um, so we're going to have some set of probabilities to try and we're going to have some set of distances to try. And then for each of the probabilities and for each of the distances we're going to compute uh, basically this. So we're going to make the circuit that distance. We're going to... Uh, what, what number of rounds should I use? 50 is a fine number. Uh, also, I need to be able to control the noise parameter. So I'm going to add a noise parameter to generate circuit. Okay, logical error rate 0. 0.132. Uh, was that lower? I don't think that was lower. Anyways, the, ob the obvious next thing to do is to, to run this for a few different sizes, and that's what I'm already writing. So we're going to add a noise parameter, which will control the strength of the noise. And to find where I put the noise in, here's where I put the noise in, and I just change this parameter to be the parameter, the argument that was given to the method, instead of a fixed 0.1%. Okay. Um, I should iterate over distance as the outer loop because I want to do the low distances first because they're quicker to do. And I should make test decoding return logical error rate. Or, or just return the number, the number of correct instead of printing stuff. And I should rename it to account for that. So run shots correct errors return correct. It's a nice overly long net method name. All right, we compute the logical error rate as the number of shots minus the number of correct, which will give us the error. We divide by the number of shots to get the rate. And then we print out the distance, the probability, the logical error rate. And we compute the threshold for probabilities. Um, 1%, 0.1%, 0.01%, and we'll use distances uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. That should be fine.
and we run. And then we stare at the screen while numbers come out. I'll maybe make these a little bigger. Uh, okay, so with one unit cell, you know, lower error rate, <laughs> lower physical error rate creates lower logical error rate. Um, it's a little worrying that this could ever be above 50%. That might just be statistical error. I'm only taking a thousand shots. It's, it's not too crazy to have plus or minus a percent when you're taking a thousand shots. Um, maybe the more interesting comparison, and the thing you actually use when you're determining the threshold, is whether or not increasing the distance makes the error rate go down at a given physical error rate. So does the logical error rate go down as the distance goes up at a given physical error rate? And that allows you to kind of determine the threshold. So you can see 1% is probably above it because it's basically staying the same. Um, I might want to take more samples. Uh, you can you can also see that distance three is taking a lot longer than the other ones. I don't actually know which part of this is taking a long time. Stim is pretty fast at sampling circuits. It might be in pi matching, but I don't I don't really want to blame pi matching without actual data. Let's maybe put some some timing in here while we're waiting. C zero equals time dot time. Put the monotonic clock. And decode time is T two minus T one. Sample time is T one minus T zero. Okay. Okay, so this is a little weird. At point one percent, it went from forty percent to twenty percent to fifteen percent. It's weird that the the drop wasn't consistent. I, I mean, I say it's weird, but it, I, I don't know enough about the code to really say whether or not that's expected or not. Cer certainly with most error correcting codes, as you increase the distance, you get bigger jumps going from even to odd numbers than from odd to even numbers, just, just because you have, instead of a tiebreaker, you have an obvious win. Like in, if there are two errors and you have a distance of three, then you uh, sorry, if you have one error and you have a distance of three, then you correct it. If you have two errors, it fails. But at distance four, you don't correct two errors. You just kind of randomly guess, and so you don't get all of them. So that could be the effect that's happening here. I am, I am wondering what's taking so long. I'm gonna I'm gonna kill it and I'm gonna run it again so that I can I can see what's consuming all the time. Uh okay, it's <laughs> it's definitely decoding that's consuming all of the time by like a factor of a hundred. Oh, wow. Yeah. And the factor is getting worse. Okay, he, here's here's the current plan. I want to I want to get a good idea of what the threshold for this code is. I I can see that it's going to take a little while going to much bigger distances, so I'm going to limit. I'm going to limit myself to small distances, even though I'd prefer not to. If I had a more performant decoder, I could go higher, 
Um, I, I do have access to them, but I, I don't have them already hooked up in this way, and I probably can't put them in a public video. So I'll stick with pie matching for now. And uh, I know I said that I should do the distances second, but since the relevant metric... The relevant metric is whether or not the pro the logical error rate goes down as the distance increases. I should I should maybe do that second. Um, reduce the distances to just one, two, three, four. I don't know if this is enough shots to get statistical accuracy for what I want. Like I, I think I might end up having to let this run for an hour or two. And I, I don't like that I'm only going up to distance four. Actually, I shouldn't say distance. This is technically not a distance. It's it's just a like a a spatial scaling metric. I haven't confirmed that the code distance is actually four when I pass in four here. I just know that the thing gets bigger. I mean, for all I know, the distance could be half that or double that. Uh, regardless. I want to print out data that I can then plot. And I want to I want to maybe save it to a file. So I'll open up data for writing. Print distance, probability. Ah, this is not probability, this is physical error rate. And then we're going to print out a formatted string that will be actually be CSV data. Should also keep track of how many shots I've actually done. And I should keep the original number of successes just in case I want to run this thing multiple times and aggregate the data later. I shouldn't be storing the logical error rate. I should be storing the something a little bit raw. And then I can print it out to the terminal as it runs, just so I have some idea. Okay, let's let's start that running and see what happens. It's a little worrying that I'm not seeing any output at all. Okay, we have some output. At a distance one with a probability of 1%, or a physical error rate of 1%. And this, this physical error rate is going to a depolarizing noise source that occurs before each parity measurement. Take 10,000 shots. It got slightly more than half of them right. And the logical error rate is around 50%. Then it's going to increase the distance too, and it's going to take even longer. Uh, okay, to get to get a sense of whether or not this is working, I'm going to massively decrease the number of shots. Like so, I'm going to decrease the number of rounds also to just six. And in in the circuit, I'm also going to increase, decrease the number of adding rounds, four to two. Does that still run? It still runs. It goes much faster now, that's for sure. That's a little bit more encouraging. 
but I want to try more probabilities. So we tried 0 0.01. Let's try 0 0.05. Okay, that's not bad. Okay, that's not bad. Ten percent. It doesn't seem to be going down. But sorry, at one percent, it doesn't seem to be going down. At point five percent, it's well within the statistical noise. And at point one percent, it's these look lower than that one. Definitely, the downside of taking a hundred shots is that this is extremely noisy. Uh, and then two times lower than that, these just kind of look flat, and then these ones are saying zero. I need more shots. I also need to, to simplify what's what's coming out on the terminal. Okay. And all right, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have the line sort of accumulate as it goes. So we're gonna have distance d, and then we're going to put in. Actually, just print out the number that are correct. Since I'm taking the same shots for each of them, that's fine. Okay. Keep the file print. Not using logical error rate anymore. At the end of it, terminate the line. Let's reduce the number of shots for a second just to see what it looks like as it comes out. Okay, the, di the distances aren't... having the distances isn't really helping. Try that again. Okay. It's it's this these like polishing steps. I don't even know. I don't even know if I would enjoy watching these kind of polishing steps. I certainly enjoy doing this kind of polishing, where you you just take something and just kind of make it nicer, 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 and in order to see if you can get interesting stuff out. Uh, I shouldn't be printing out the number correct here. I should be printing out the number of failures. So the number of shots minus the number correct. And then... Why are these highlighted? Okay, it's just wrong. Uh, when can I finally get this thing to let it run? Just let it go. Okay. I'm kind of liking how this looks, other than the fact that they don't they don't line up properly. So I'll um I'll left pad it. Or I guess Python calls it justifying. Yeah. Uh justify to a width of I don't know, fifty. Yeah, fifty's a little overkill, but it works. Okay, I'm liking how the output looks. Let's Bump up the number of shots again. 
maybe sample at more probabilities. I mean, this is probably enough to find the, the threshold. The threshold is almost definitely between 1% and 0.01%. Honestly, it's probably between 1% and 0.1%. So maybe I should have more granularity there. Yeah, I like I like that idea. Let's just do a linear sweep. From 0.1% to one percent like so and then we look for the one where it stops going down so at 0.1 percent at distance one where again distance is not technically correct, but it's like this first size scale. So I'm just, I'm just going to keep calling it distance. At distance one, I have 10,000 shots. There were 1,300 failures. And then at distance two, there were about 700. And at distance three, again, almost 700. That's a little worrying. Maybe the threshold is actually below 0.1% for this type of noise. And of course, it takes a lot longer to get the, the next distance. Yeah, that that looks like it's above threshold instead of below threshold. So maybe I have to do a linear sweep from 0.01% to 0.1% instead. Yeah, it looks like it's going to do the same thing where it kind of goes down and comes back up, maybe. Okay, let's add a zero. And try again. Adding a zero is maybe problematic because I have to take more shots in order to see failures. It could also be, like I, I say I'm computing the threshold, but it could also be that I'm just doing the wrong thing. Like I maybe I'm missing some of the detectors that I'm supposed to be using in order to correct the errors. Or maybe I put some sort of mistake in the circuit. I wish I had... Um, software to plot out the circuit in 3D space so that I could just look at the structure of it and see if it looked right instead of having to look at it as text. Yeah, seeing the same pattern of it gets lower and then it comes back up. Looks like there's going to have to be another cut in the video where I think about this for a while and then come back. Okay, it is a few hours later. I went and did something else, had, had lunch and so forth, just to get my mind off it. And then I remembered. I'm actually not supposed to have noise in the first rounds, and... Uh, so right here, I'm building up the circuit, and I'm trying to do a noiseless initialization, and then begin turning the detectors on while there's still no noise, and then have noisy rounds. But all of these are using the circuit that I put a depolarizing operation in the middle of. Sorry, I, I uncommented this just before starting recording. So I'm I'm putting noise in the parts of the circuit that I assumed were noiseless and that needed to be noiseless given how I 
set up the correction. And so I think the reason that the, it looks like the error rate went down as the distance went from 1 to 2 and then back up as it went from 2 to 3 to 4 is because the parts that were being corrected were initially dominant and were then suppressed. And then these parts in the initial four and final four rounds started to win out because these aren't being corrected. So what I need to do is I need to split the circuit properly into two pieces, some one with noise, one without. And in order to do that, I really need to extract a function so that I can invoke the same functionality a couple times. So I'm going to take this whole little block that's, that's making the circuit. And I'm going to pull that into a function. And then I'm going to call the function twice, you know, once with a Boolean that's false, once the Boolean that's true for adding the noise or not. And I might also want to pull the detectors into that function. Let's grab those as well. Okay, so generate circuit rounds parameterized. And this is going to have a boolean to decide the noise, so it is noisy. Cool. And it's going to return a list of three circuits, and those are going to be the three separate rounds. Sorry, I just... Got a message. I'm going to close my browser on the other screen. All right. So I just paste that loop in. And then basically I'm going to fix all of the issues that come up by passing in information as it's needed. Okay, so we need some of the data that we computed in other places, like the hex centers. Uh, I'm going to require keywords here so that I can't possibly mis mix up the orders. Uh, we need this noise parameter. No, actually, it might make sense for this noise parameter to be the one that I either set to zero or not zero. So just say... If the noise parameter is not zero, then we include the noise. Okay. The hex centers are dictionary from complex to integers because they're categorized as round zero, one, or two. This is an integer. And. Is there any other thing that's needed? It looks like no. I shouldn't be putting these detector bits into separate a separate list now. I should just be appending them into the existing round circuits. And now I can take everything from here all the way down to here, and I can replace that this. So round circuits noiseless equals Pass in all the parameters that are needed, so the noise is zero, because this is a noiseless one. Also, I wanted the initial rounds not to have detectors, so I'm going to need a boolean for that. I'm going to have to weave that through here. Right. 
So if I want the detectors, then I include this stuff. And if I don't, then I don't. Also, it looks like I'm... I'm just going to be adding these three, three, three things together anyways. So I, I might as well not return them in three pieces. I might as well just return them as, as one thing. I kind of wonder if, if this format where I'm just kind of coding things would work better if I had someone watching me do it live because then they could ask questions that people watching the video are probably asking. Uh, I know I've heard Dave Bacon say in the past that like watching someone else use a computer, especially if they don't have like a complete planned out thing ahead of time, is just this very strange experience where you know, flashing lights and mo movement and you don't really understand what's going on in their head. Anyways. Uh, okay. Round circuit. Noiseless. No detectors. Okay. No noise. No detectors. Generate circuit. I'll call this generate circuit cycle. And then we're going to have no noise yes detectors. And then we're going to have yes noise yes detectors. And then we're going to put those pieces together. Sorry, I don't want that anymore. Don't want that or that. This detector cycle append shift towards. This is supposed to be in the cycle and it belongs right here. Okay. Full circuit, put the cubic coordinates in, get the data initialization, and then start putting in the cycles. So I, I have new names for these cycles now, I suppose, which were round circuit no noise detectors. And then round circuit no noise yes detectors, and then yes, yes, and then un ease out in the opposite direction. All right, I should probably look at the circuit. I'll just terminate the program right after that. Just kind of glance and see if it makes sense. So this is distance, I believe this is distance one. There are 12 qubits and in the unit cell, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12-ish. Yeah, like 12-ish qubits. We initialize the data. We perform parity measurements for the first round where we get the qubits into the correct basis. We do CNOTs around measurement in order to get the parities. And then we multiply stuff along the path into the observable. We repeat that for the next round and the next round. And those three rounds make the cycle. We do that all twice. So that completes our two noiseless cycles with no detectors, which gets the system like, guaranteed into a consistent state. Then we do two more cycles, which are basically the same thing, except additionally, we're declaring detectors, which are sets of measurement that we compare in order to get detection events. Uh, so at the end of each of the rounds, each of the three rounds within the cycle, we get Two detectors, two more detectors, two more detectors. We repeat 
that twice. And then finally we get into kind of more of the meat where we turn on the noise. So we're going to do six rounds of noisy cycles or six noisy cycles of which there will be three rounds within each of the six cycles. So that's 18 noisy rounds. Here's the depolarizing noise in the circuit, which is just before the parity measurement. So this is maybe a bit of a strange noise model where we're kind of assuming that it's sort of like you have just a physical two qubit measurement operation, but that physical two qubit measurement operation has a tendency to insert depolarization into the system. And actually there's not even a chance of the measurement result being wrong other than via that depolarization going into the system. Maybe a more realistic one would have the measurements output be uh, noisy itself also, but let's just stick with the simple one. Uh, yeah, so we do that, and then we go through the detectors with no noise again, and then through the no noise bit, and then finally, finally, we measure out the data. I this now should shouldn't it this should have fixed that issue where there it didn't seem like there was a threshold before, because. Before, what was happening is I was accidentally putting noise into these padding rounds, and these padding rounds were just there so they didn't have to do the fault-tolerant initialization and the fault-tolerant measurement. And because there was noise in them, that assumption was effectively broken. And so I'm pretty sure I was just seeing spam error. I was seeing state preparation and measurement error that was growing with the distance because I didn't, I intentionally didn't try to protect that. Uh, so we'll go back down here to what we're going to run. So we're going to try to compute the threshold by doing a range of probabilities. Uh, I'm going to put this back into sweeping 0.1% to 0.9%, going you know through the smallest distances, and we're going to see if, if we get better or worse as we increase the distance at these probabilities. And we're taking 10,000 shots, which is maybe not enough to get really good statistics, but we can bas we're basically going to be able to see what happens. So, at a physical error rate of 0.1%, at distance 1, and uh, I guess I'll repeat again, this is not distance like code distance, this is just a scaling parameter on the code. I don't actually know what the code distance is. I haven't worked that out. Anyways, at 0.1%, the numbers are clearly going down. The number of errors that occur is going down. You know, at... Distance 1, there's 300. Distance 2, there's 80. Distance 3, there's 3. Distance 4, we didn't even take enough shots to see one. 0.2%, uh, again, you see like a clear decreasing signal. This is working so much better than it did before now that there's not spam error secretly in the system. And I might stop talking talking just so that I can fast forward through this because this is basically going to be the next two minutes it's just me me staring at these numbers come in what I'm hoping to see is at some point this number is going to get big enough and instead of this going down it's going to go up and that's going to indicate that we went past the threshold of the code at least Doing the decoding the way we're doing it, we went past the threshold of the code. I'm actually not doing a particularly complicated form of decoding. I'm just uh, passing the edges along to PyMatch. I'm not doing any sort of correlated analysis. So um, I would run this again, but I, I would have to stop the, the run in order to do so. But I, I can print out the error model that Stim is deriving from the circuit. And I remember that in that error model, there were components... Uh, there were errors that would set off three or four detectors. And the thing about errors that set off three or four detectors is that when you try to turn your error model into a graph, those would be hyper edges instead of edges. So edges have two endpoints, so you'd expect two detectors. And typically you'll also have like boundary edges, which would have one detector. Um, so you have to do stuff in order to decompose the three and four detector errors into one and two detector errors and then do matching on them. And the way that you incorporate them into the matching is you do some sort of like correlated analysis where you say, if the detectors 
on one of the components of that four component error are present and I've decomposed it into two edges, then when one edge occurs, when you think one edge occurs, you should increase your probability of the other edge occurring and you get this like back and forth correlation thing. Anyways, you turn that on and it, maybe it shifts the threshold a little. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, okay, looking back at the numbers here, that still looks like they're solidly going down as we increase the physical error rate. So you can see that the, the number of errors is increasing as we increase the physical error rate. The number of logical errors goes up. Um, but the second distance is still lower. Um, this is actually kind of kind of impressive. I was expecting Newman and I have a bet about where the error rate is going to be, and Newman bet that it would be at 0.3%. Although, I did then explain to him the error model I was going to use, which is just this these two qubit depolarizing errors um, on the edges. And he wanted to he wanted to increase his bet, like the the sorry, he wanted to increase the threshold guess based on that error model because it's sort of a very forgiving error model. But uh, he never did actually get around to telling me what the higher threshold is, so all I remember is the 0.3%. I, I also was going to bet somewhere around 0.3% as where the threshold would be for this. Um, just because this is sort of a circuit level noise model almost, and you know, the surface code has a threshold around 1%, and the color code has a threshold around 0.1%. I, I actually don't know that one too well. And I sort of expected this one to be somewhere in between. On the other hand, you know, if you don't have circuit level noise, if you have depolarizing noise, the surface code's threshold goes up to like 10%. So, depending on exactly what noise model you pick, you can get a fact, and easily get a factor of 10 difference in your thresholds. So it's it's hard to say how much of given that I just kind of picked this noise model arbitrarily, it's kind of hard to say how much of what's going on here is the code, like the error correction code being good versus the noise model being forgiving. I haven't carefully thought about that yet. Um I am definitely surprised that they're still going down as we get close to 1% error. Like I, I can tell that I'm going to have to sweep a bigger range of errors in order to, to get the results. Um, I'm also going to edit this to append to the CSV file instead of overwriting it when I run it again, because I don't want to lose the data that I've already collected. And I'm just going to... I'm going to quickly search how do I append into a, a file in Python. Python append file write. Uh, how do you append? It's okay. It looks like it's a cool software engineer people. This is how it's done. I'm just gonna wait for that to finish, and then I'm going to. Hmm, I guess I'm going to sweep. The next range and i'm going to take slightly bigger steps so logical error is still going down at 0.9 percent physical error rate polarizing on each of the edges Just have to wait for this number to come in, which looks like it's going to be somewhere around 100. It was, in fact, somewhere around 100. All right. If you're excited by those numbers streaming in, get ready because it's time for part two of numbers slowly streaming in.
Um, in the meantime, maybe maybe I should start writing code to open this file and plot the data. So plot data from a file pass. So we're going to need matplotlib's pyplot import matplotlib pyplot nice plot. And then we're just going to make a bunch of curves. Python has a CSV reader of some sort, right? Python, CSV reader. Yeah, we've got a CSV package. And they've got a reader. It takes a file. The dialect. Uh, I don't think I need to specify the dialect. It should be fine. And then what methods does it have? Reader takes an iterator of that. Oh, keywords. Oh, I just iterate over the rows. Okay. Store row in reader. Um... The first row is just going to be the header. So I'm going to skip that one. I don't know if this supports like indexing or slicing, but I'm not going to not going to check. And I am going to need a dictionary which maps distances to pairs of probability pairs of probabilities one in physical one logical so distance to prob pairs is a dictionary from integer to tuple of doubles or i guess in python they're called floats Um, I, I noticed something about like dictionaries, like I, ideally I'd like to not have to remember what the columns are, I just want to say what their names are. Dick. Uh. I can also read and write data in dictionary form using the dict reader. Create an object that operates on the grade reader but maps the information in reach row to a dict whose keys are given by the optional field names parameter. Field names is the sequence. To mid, the values of the row file will be used as. Uh, oh, the values in the first row will be used as the field names. That's exactly what I want. So, like that. Uh, and they have an example, reader equals dict reader for row and reader, print row, first name, row, last name. Yeah, that's exactly what I want. And it looks like it's going to handle skipping the first row for me. Uh, so my rows were called this. It's it's kind of gross that I had to comment this out in order to append into the file. I really should have made this uh, an option. Yeah, that makes me feel a little better. Um... So I have distance, physical error rate, so distance equals row distance. And this should be an integer. I don't know if it's going to come in as a string or parsed as an, as an integer, but either way, this will make it be an integer. And similarly, for the physical error rate, number of shots, 
number that are correct. Um, technically, the way I've defined these rows, they're cumulative, so uh, maybe I declare a little data class to keep track of of the the what's happening. So uh, this is a distance experiment data class. It has a number of shots. It has a number of correct. It applies to a specific probability. Uh, well, I, I should be clear and call this physical error rate. And then instead of this dictionary containing tuples, it'll contain distance experiment data. Uh, I can also, uh, I could give these default values, but hmm. <laughs> if distance and distance to probability pairs, or if it's not in it, then I want to put a default value in. So distance probability pairs distance is initialized to distance experiment data with physical error rate. Oh, oh wait, the physical error rate should be part of the key. Fair enough. Uh, if the key is not in there, then we initialize it to num shot zero and num correct zero. Although actually, now, now that I don't have that that field, I can use a default dictionary. Ah, uh, whatever. I don't need to do that. Uh, looking down at, down at this experiment, it does look like the numbers are, like, the ratio between them is starting to get a little closer. We are, I guess we're racing against this process down here, finding the threshold, so we can actually plot it. Uh, if key is not in, put it in. Take them shots. And then... Yeah, increase it. So, hmm. I don't. I don't like. I don't like how this this code is ending up. Uh, I know that I want to. Ultimately, I want to draw plots that are grouped by physical error rate as the distance changes, so I need to, like, group them, and I'm not making them in a grouped way. Uh, so I want to make groups of physical error rates, then distances. Instead of both of them together. So, error rate noise to distance to results. If physical error rate is not is not in noise to distance to results, then we put that dictionary in there, and then we get that dictionary. Um, actually, Python has a reasonably simple way of doing this, where you call set default, where if it doesn't exist, it'll use this default value. This is a little bit inefficient, because every time I invoke this line, I'm going to create an empty dictionary. On the other hand, it's Python, and I'm already throwing away a factor of 100 in performance just by making that choice, so, you know, what's another 1%? Uh, D is set to that. And then we do the same basic thing at the next level to get results there. And 
this time our default value is just a new value of distance experiment data, which initially has no shots and no, no corrects. And then we increase the shots and the corrects based on the data from the row. Okay, that loads the data. Then for the physical error rates in the noise to distance to results dictionary in the keys, and we want to go from biggest to or from, from lowest error rate to highest error rate, I guess. And then for the distances that were actually done at that error rate. Um, all right, for the distances in the keys of this group, so this is a group of distances, group keys, data is noise distance results of the distance. Okay. Uh, and then we're going to be building up X data points and Y data points. So on the X axis, this distance, did I get this backwards? So I think I, I did get this backwards. And I originally got it forwards and I flipped it around. Anyways, I want to go distance to noise, not noise to distance. Flip that, flip that, flip that. Uh, this is distance now, this is physical error rate now. Flip that, flip that. Okay. Append the physical error rate for the X coordinate, and then we append the data's logical error rate, which I'm going to make a property of this class. It is number of shots minus the number that were correct to get the errors to divide by the number of shots to get the rate. Okay, and then we gather, well, I think I just plot, actually. I plot X's and Y's, and then I say, uh, I can never remember all the matplotlib things. Like, is this label or is it S? Anyways, I want the label to be the distance. So D equals D. Play, oh, distance. And then I want there to be the legend showing up, and I want to show it after all that is done. Okay. Um, I know I can edit this main configuration to allow it to run in parallel, so I can run it again without stopping the existing run, which is still chugging along. And then if I run it, it shouldn't kill the other one. It should just... Oh, <laughs> I am glad that that didn't go in because it would have opened the file again and possibly scrambled the data. I want it to say flat data. And this should also take the thing that it writes into as a path so that it can be changed by the caller. Anyways, plot data. Uh, from data.csv. I think that's all it takes. Statement seems to have no... But, oh, okay. Run. Key error. Distance. What? D goes to A.
Okay, I think I might have used the dict reader wrong. Let's actually just see what <laughs> what is in this file. Uh, F dot. I think I just say read, and I'll just dump everything, and then uh, and then stop. Okay. No, that. See, this this looks like it makes sense to me. We've got our header saying what the values are. We've got the various things that we ran with the distances and the probabilities saying how much of each there were. Oh. Oh, I don't think I think this is expecting to be given a file instead of a file path. I think it's interpreting the path I gave it as if it were CSV data. Maybe. Yeah, like that. That certainly made a lot more sense there. Uh, the rows look right. I can stop printing them, and I can just look at what this this error is. Group distance physical key error. Ah, that makes sense. Run it again. Group. Ah, same error other side. Okay. At distance one. As the error rate goes up, uh, wait, why shouldn't, shouldn't this data be in the file? Oh, it's not flushing it. I forgot to say that it should flush the data here. And so it's just like building it up in a buffer instead of writing it to the file. So I, I can't see the, I, I, I'm only seeing the, um, I'm only seeing the data from the previous run. I have to wait for this to finish to actually see results, which looks problematic because it's taking longer and longer and longer, but, which is kind of typical of when you're decoding, like it, it takes longer as the error rates go up because you get more detection events that you have to match. And um, particularly the way Pi matching works, where it, it does the decoding on this, this kind of derived graph from the graph of possible errors, where it has been, um, oh, what's the word? All of the nodes that didn't have a detection on them have been kind of collapsed in so that the edges are between the detection events. And this introduces a bunch of requirements, like you have to pick how many paths you're willing to keep in the graph. So I'm just working on the, the original thing. Anyways, that process can get really, really expensive as the number of detection events goes up because you end up doing all-to-all -all path computations. And they're, those are expensive. Oof. I would like to include these in the plot while it's running. I could kill it after this this one finishes and I could manually enter the data. It might also be the case that when I kill it, the um the width statement that I'm using will take care of flushing the file. So right here I say width open path is F. And when I click this button to kill it, it'll send an it'll cause an exception as it runs one of these lines. And that will hopefully cause it to kick out and flush as part of leaving the width block. But I don't want to do that before this term gets computed because this term is, is kind of expensive. Uh, in the meantime, I can get prepared to run the next invocation of it. Uh, 
Uh, okay, so it's done. These three. I have to say that I'm attending. I have to say the path. Don't really want to plot it. Okay, there we go. Kill it. Actually, before I run it again, let's see. Let's see if it flushed. If it didn't flush, I'm just going to. Ooh, I don't want to lose this data. Run the plot. Okay, it does in fact look like it flushed, and oh, that's. An interesting looking shape. I should probably be plotting this in log coordinates, shouldn't I? Uh, it will look much better in log coordinates. Math dot log. Uh, log is ten. And the negative because these are always going to be fractional. Oh, uh, I, if there's, if there's a zero, uh, plus, all right, we'll just clamp it at 11. Okay, uh, it's a little confusing that it, that it's negated. Good, good. Oh, actually, I shouldn't be doing this myself. I should be relying on plot to do this. So I want um, log, semi-log y. Are these options or are these calls? Yeah, auto generated. Do not edit as changes. That's that's great. <laughs> that's great documentation. Matt Plotlib, good job. Okay, it, it it's a a thing to turn on an option. Okay, this this looks a little bit more like what I would expect the shape of these curves to 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 be, where uh, I st it's kind of weird that they kind of jump down like this. But it does look like they're going to all converge to one spot. Anyways. Let's get back to running the threshold computation. Like It, it looks like the, the data was preserved based on what I was seeing in the plots. Uh, we're going to skip the first three. We're going to run the remaining. Because we already computed the first three. One of the data points in here looks like it finished, so that one data point will have 20,000 shots instead of 10,000, but that's fine. We're not drawing error bars or anything, so it's not a problem. Okay, looking at the plot again. Okay, good. All right, there's. I don't think there's much to do now, other than to watch the data come in. Like, is is there something else I can improve about the code? I guess I could go around extracting functions, uh, adding more comments and such. Um, I could work out how to do the fault tolerant initialization, but then I'd have to run the the data collection again. Like, I, I don't want to touch the circuit code, because if I touch the circuit code, I might want to make changes to the circuit, and doing so will you know, invalidate all of this data because I would, if I ran it again and I put them together, I'd be aggregating data from two different things, which would be very confusing. Um, actually, maybe what I'll do is I'll just do an overview of all that that's happened this whole time because, you know, we 
I've generated 400 lines of code here. I kind of done it in a weird order as I figured it out. Let's let's just go over it from top to bottom. Okay, so at the top here, there's all the imports. Uh, so we're you know we're using Matplotlib for plotting. We're using Stim for simulation. We're using Pi matching for error decoding. Um, I'm putting type annotations everywhere. That that kind of stuff. Um, then the first thing that the code does is it starts defining data that's defining the coordinate system that I'm going to be using. So in particular, I'm I'm explicitly writing out that here, in, in this system, there are three types of edges. There, there are the horizontal edges and there are the two directions of diagonal edges. And each of those has a type associated, like a measurement basis and, you know, a, a direction. So here I'm saying the type, ooh, ooh. I'm saying the types of the edges. I'm saying how to get from the center of one hex over that edge to the hex on the other side. So like from this hex over this edge to that, to that hex there. Uh, as well as how do I go from the center of the hex to the qubit in that direction. So from the center here to the qubit that's here. Uh, then there's some more data saying if you're at the center of the hex, how do you get to the pair to the edges that are around it? So if you're at the center of this hex, uh, this is kind of filled up with stuff. If you're at the center of this hex here, if you're If you're here, if, if there, if you're here, then there's this edge and there's this edge and there's this edge and there's this edge. And those, those are encoded here as coordinate pairs, which you would add into the center to get, you know, these two corners, which are the qubits that define the edge. All right. So that's, that's that data. Then we have this method, which generates three rounds of the circuit parametrized by like do we want noise in this cycle do we want uh, detectors in this cycle and this this thing takes a bunch of uh computed things such as what are all the centers of the hexes what is our indexing scheme for the qubits like for the positions of the qubits what is the index of the qubit at that position how much noise how many like what is our distance scale and this is kind of the meat of the circuit, is the stuff in here. So each cycle has three rounds. There's, there's round zero, round one, and round two annotated here. Like during, during round zero, we're doing these measurements of the edges between the zeros. During round one, we do the edges between the ones. And during round two, we do the edges between the twos. Uh, so the first thing that we kind of figure out uh, is what are all the edges that are going to happen in this round? And we group them based on their color here or, you know, X, Y, or Z. Then we get all the qubits that are part of X edges or Y edges in this round and just put them in lists or actually we put their indices into lists so that we can easily operate on them. Then we begin the circuit for the round. We apply single qubit rotations to the X and Y qubits so that they, instead of measuring X, X, or Y, Y on them, we now want to measure ZZ after the rotations in order to measure X, X, or Y, Y before the rotations. Those would be equivalent. Then we go over each of the edges and we want to perform a parity measurement on them and we're decomposing that parity measurement into a C naught, then a measurement on the target of the C naught, and then a, another C naught undoing the, the first one. Um, we're assuming that these the this process is noisy, so we're putting depolarizing noise just before that C naught, uh, before the first C naught specifically. Uh, then we insert the measurements, and we're keeping track of the measurements as we do them. We're like putting into a log, you know, I measured this edge. 
first, I measure that edge second, and so forth, so that we can refer to those measurements later when we want to build up our logical observable or declare detection events. Uh, after we've done that measurement, we just undo the C knots and the single qubit rotations to complete the parity measurement process. Uh, one of the strengths of STEM is on display here, by the way, which is I didn't have to associate a noise process with a gate type. Like, it's not the case that every time I put a C knot in, I incur some noise, or every time I put a measurement in, I incur some noise. I have complete flexibility on where I put my noise channels in the circuit. So I specifically decided to put it, you know, after the single qubit rotations before the first C knot. Because it's two qubit polarizing noise, it would be equivalent to put it before these two rotations. Anyways, uh, this, this is very flexible. It's not always so convenient. Like, it, it does force you to do work to say exactly what you want at a very low level, but it is very flexible. Uh, anyways, continuing on. At the end of the round, within, or at, end of, at the end of each round, of the three rounds within the cycle, we say which of the measurements from that round are going into the logical observable, which ones are being used to move the logical observable so it doesn't anti-commute with the next round. Uh, and if you recall, basically what this, this code is doing is it's going along this column and just finding what are all the edges that are along this column. So in this round, it would be this red edge, this blue edge, this red edge, and that blue edge. And it's multiplying all those into the logical observable, which should be going along that column. And that completes the round. Uh, if you don't want to do detections. Um, I, I can't, at this point in the code, it doesn't immediately compute what the detectors are. Because, just because of a sort of structural issue around the code where it's building up this this measurement times dictionary, and until it's done all three rounds, it doesn't have all the measurement times. And because the detectors refer to times from other rounds, it's not possible to put the detectors in before you've computed these times. You, you could rearrange the code to, to fix this issue, but that, that's just not how I wrote it. All right, uh, assuming that you do want to be doing detectors during the round, then it figures out things to compare at the end of the round. So specifically, each of these hexes is a stabilizer of the code. So this hex with zero at the center is a thing that we can expect to stay sort of consistent over the, the lifetime. There, there's a particular three body observable over these six qubits, uh, sorry, a six body observable of these six qubits, which commutes with all the measurements that are being performed and which you can build out of the measurements, the two, the two body measurements that are being performed. And essentially what this code is saying is as soon as you've done the measurements that allow you to build a detector, put them all together and tell STEM by appending into the, the circuit, this detector annotation, how to do that, like wh which measurements to compare. And once that's done, you just concatenate the three rounds together to get the cycle. That is how the cycle is generated. Now at a slightly higher level where we, because I haven't written code to do the fault tolerant initialization or fault tolerant measurement, we have to put together some noiseless cycles and noisy cycles in order to get something reasonable. Also, we, we still have to compute these, these values that are passed into the cycle generation method. Uh, so like we have this code to find all the centers of the hexes in the squared off coordinate system that we're using. Then some code to figure out all the qubits based on the hexes to index the qubits. Then we get our three different types of cycles, the which have or don't have noise or have or don't have detectors. Um, and then we start the circuit, like the, the, the real circuit that we're ultimately building. And the first thing that we put into it is little annotations saying where the qubits are, which has no effect on the simulation. It's purely a, like a metadata thing so that when you print it out, you, you have it as a reference. Um, 
some of the the meatier stuff in this method is the fact that we're figuring out the basis to initialize the data qubits in in order to get the logical observable in a deterministic state from the start. So that's that's what's being done here. And then once that logical observable is initialized, we can then start doing the full circuit, which we do by combining our like no noise part in order to get our noiseless preparation. Uh, and then we do a noiseless part with some detectors, just just to make sure that the interface between the noisy part and the noiseless part isn't missing anything. Like there there are the detectors that we're defining within these rounds sometimes stretch like their sensitivities stretch a little bit across the rounds, or they might be relying on previous rounds or future round detectors stretching in. Um, I don't know whether or not removing this will cause problems. It's, it's here to be safe. Anyway, so we put this noiseless padding and this detector padding on on both sides in order to allow us to test the bulk case. Uh, and then once all those rounds are done, we uh, we do the data qubit measurements, which effectively is done exactly the same way as the um, initialization. There is this caveat that we're requiring there to be an even number of rounds because of this effect where it it takes, uh, sorry, an even number of Wow, I really shouldn't use the term rounds here. I should say cycles. We're requiring there to be an even number of cycles because after one cycle, the observable that started here ends up here. And these two things are not the same. Like, they are just not the same. That's why requiring that to be even. A better version of the code would not have that constraint. It would instead say, you know, if it's an odd number of cycles, just do a slightly different measurement. Or even, um, it wouldn't even require you to do full cycles. It could just take an arbitrary number of rounds, actual rounds. So you could run, you know, seven rounds or 13 rounds or other numbers of rounds that weren't a multiple of three. And it would just know what the logical observable was after every single round and be able to do the measurement appropriately. Anyways, once you finish the data measurements, uh, you can include them into the logical observable. So what we've been building up over this whole time is like which data measurements define the logical observable and the data measurements that define this logical observable are all the data measurements that lie on this path through all of time. And also at the end, these single qubit data measurements in these bases. Is, that is how the logical observable is defined. And that gives us the circuit. Okay. Now that we have the circuit, we can start doing our, our like decoding stuff. So uh, where do I make the circuit here? Yeah, so here, I make my circuit for a given distance and noise. And then I, I derive an error model from it. So this, this is functionality in STEM that replaces the circuit with, you know, like it's Clifford operations and depolarizing errors and other like Clifford concepts. And it compiles all of that down into a series of independent um, error mechanisms that are specified only in terms of which detectors they set off and whether or not they flip the logical observable. So when you, so if you look at a circuit, it'll have things like, oh, I do a Hadamard on zero and I do a CNOT on zero one and you know, things like that. If you look at one of these detector error models, they say like, there is an error. It has a particular probability. It flips detector two and detector five and it flips the frame of logic of logical observable zero. And then there is another error. It is independent of the first error. It occurs with this probability. It flips, you know, this, this other detector. It doesn't flip the logical observable. It's just a big long list of these. Um, with, with the nicety that it might have decomposed uh, errors that have too many symptoms into errors that have at most two symptoms. And having done that, you, you, that is something that you can pretty easily feed into a minimum weight matching decoder because 
Uh, in this case, what's being done is it's just going over all the errors and it's finding the ones that have at most two symptoms. It's throwing away everything bigger than that as too confusing, which, which is fine. They, those all decompose into the smaller errors. So this is, it's an approximation, but it's still, it's still going to have a threshold. Um, anyways, uh, what, what, what this method detector error model to matching does is it just iterates over the error model, like pulling out all of those error mechanisms and turning them into edges and nodes in a graph for pi matching. And then once it has that graph, uh, it gets samples from the circuit. It uses those samples in order to populate the detection events. And it hands those detection events off to pi matching, which predicts the logical frame change based on them. And if the prediction is what was actually measured, then that's correct. Otherwise, it's incorrect. And then we just we just collect statistics. That's that's all the code is doing. Huh. This is still going. I think distance four is maybe a little bit ambitious. It's getting very painful to wait for it. I'm I'm going to truncate it here. We've always already done 0.25. I'll kill this. Start it up again. Um, let's just fill in the ones and twos for the remainder, and then if if we want, we can put in the threes. Oh, all right, I still have it set to plot. Uh, let's look at what the plot looks like so far. Not quite sure what's going on there with that, like, hitch. It's sort of weird. It does look like they're all about to converge around here, maybe. Like they're all flattening out. Let's try again, plot it, so we've got some new data in. Oh yeah. Does look like we're getting close. So um when I when I comment when I reduce the distances to just one and two and total to run for these remaining probabilities, I'm effectively just saying extend the orange and blue lines, please. I just want to see where these cross. And then once that's done, I'll extend the green line and maybe offline I'll extend the red line. I'm definitely not going to do that while recording. It's clearly going to take way too long. This video is already going to be way too long. I just want to see the intersection. I want to see the intersection and I want to declare victory. Oh, it's close. It's real close. Oh, it finished. Uh Oh, it's so close to crossing. Wait, did it cross? Plot again. Oh, it did it did it bounce or is that just statistical error? I really doubt that it would bounce. That would make no sense. Uh, I did all the way up to point oh five. Let's just keep going from there. Ah, uh, uh, the downsides of commenting out code in order to do things. Incidentally, one of the nice things about this particular design where you have some method that just appends data into a CSV file and accumulates, even if you include a row multiple times, is that you can kind of get away with this, like, oh, I'll just run a few more of these or a few more of those. Uh, you won't utterly ruin your data in the process. Oh, that looks like finally we had one that's higher.
Actually, hmm. This is around 50% error, isn't it? Maybe, <laughs> maybe it's saturating. Yeah. Oh, that makes it harder to see the threshold if it saturates. Maybe that means I have to extend these lines. Um, I'm, I'm going to add a, a plot line from 0 to 1.5.5. which is fully randomized, fully randomized line. And uh, how do I make these dashed? It doesn't matter. Yeah, so you can see that it they're saturating an error, which means that I have to do the higher distances, I think, in order to see the effect properly. Okay. Uh, let's just let's just do distance three because it takes way less time. Actually I think I think I'm gonna end the video here. I'll I'll keep collecting data and maybe I'll sorry I shouldn't say I'll end the video. I'm going to cut here and I'm just gonna go to a, a plot of the data later. Uh, I don't want to make people sit through this. It is now the next day. I left my computer running overnight collecting data. Uh, also, I discussed a lot more with Mike Newman and uh, did some improvements to the code. So, uh, like, I, I changed the type of plot from semi-log to log-log. We looked into a few other ways of putting noise into the circuit in order to try to make references to existing work on similar looking codes. Uh, it's all a little complicated, but uh, let, let's look at what we have. Uh, so you can see like I, I added a title to the plot and axes and grid lines, and it's now log log instead of semi log. And it's still in the process of computing this purple line, which is taking absolutely forever. Uh, but anyways, uh, we can see that the lines kind of converge here. Oh, oh, another important difference about this plot compared to the one that I was showing before, besides being log-log instead of semi-log, is I'm now doing an adjustment so that the error rates are being described per round instead of uh, total. So there, there's a conversion happening. Uh, yeah, a round adjustment. So we're doing six noisy cycles, which contain 18 rounds. And that gives us a total logical error rate. But we want to convert that to be sort of talking about the per round error rate. And, and so we do this conversion where we, you know, we compute the root. Uh, and that, that sort of fixes the saturation effect that we were seeing in the plots before. Uh, you, you can tell that there's more noise over here from the fact that things are starting to jump around more. Uh, this red line is jumping up to 50% because it actually had an error rate above 50% and it, it, it clamps it. Um, but overall, this, this is looking pretty good, I think. It, the interpretation of what's being shown here is sort of complicated. Um, this is sort of a weird error model. It's also sort of a weird error correcting code. So it's not exactly clear what to compare against and how to make a fair comparison. Like for, for example, one of the things that Mike and I looked at was what if you tried to do the phenomenological error model, or you, you try to do the error model where you insert depolarizing in a single layer in the circuit and you see how bad that makes it. And it did kind of surprisingly well on this metric. So we collected data for that. 
Uh, and you can see here that there's a crossing at around 13, 14%. It is very strange that this is 13 or 14%, according to, according to Newman. Uh, he thinks that it should be around 8 or 9%. And he thinks it has something to do with the fact that the circuit is divided into rounds. And during the inter, like when we, in the layer where we insert this noise, we're kind of cutting through some of the rounds in a way that makes it too easy to tell where some of the errors are. Anyways, I, I don't really want to get into that. I just don't, kind of want to give an example of the fact that it's difficult to interpret these results in a way that makes them comparable to previous work because of the strangeness of the code. Um, but overall, I, I, I feel like I have enough data now to declare victory for what I wanted to do in this video, which was just take this weird quantum error correcting code and try to put it into STEM as an example of using STEM to do kind of research level work. Um, the interpretation of what these curves mean is up for debate, but you know they are they are well formed curves. They are they're taken from real simulation data. Um, yeah. So I I I don't know what the who the audience is for this video. It, like most error correction researchers aren't necessarily interested in the the finicky details of programming something, and most programmers aren't really familiar with quantum error correction research. So maybe the remaining audience is the empty set, but I still think it's interesting to take, take that and show how the, show how the meat is made. So that's, that's everything that I have. Uh, I will, I will take this code and I'll put a link to it in the video description. If you have any questions, just, just leave them as comments and I will answer them. And other than that, uh, Thank you for watching, if that's anyone, and uh, have a nice day.